morning. So I can be ethical around you, Cynthia. Um, even though I thought I was not going to be here, it's time I work. Remember, you're on YouTube. Uh, annual stormwater update, Dr. Keller. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Well, one of our conditions every year is to, um, on our permit, is to give you a brief update. I'll be short uh, and to the point this morning in both presentations. Um, for the 2010 stormwater utility this year, um, we have completed uh, our finalizing the last draft of our watershed assessments that in 2008 we started in compliance with our stormwater permit and our wastewater permits. Uh, those plans consist of monitoring plans throughout the watershed, um, the watershed assessment itself, and then the watershed implementation plans. And you'll see some more of this in the future, but what the implementation plans are is how we're going to remove pollutants um, from, our uh, from entering our receiving waters that go to the Flint River. Uh, and you'll see more of that in the future, especially through the budget cycle. The second thing is we've received um, our six 319 grant. It's probably the most there is uh, a city in the state that's received them back to back. Um, and basically what's with that, this particular 319 grant is on the golf course, there's an 84 inch line that, you, that we will address next in next year's budget that has collapsed. We've got more rock in that pipe than we got um, line right now. Uh, we will what they call daylight that do stream restoration and um, bring that back to its natural state. Uh, the second part of the grant we're doing this year, we're um, uh, next commission meeting, hopefully we'll have a resolution for, not a resolution, but an intergovernmental agreement between us and Spalding County to do some stream restoration and mitigation over at the library. And we'll be tearing out some pavement over there, putting in porous pavement. There'll be an educational trail there and some stream restoration along that bank, which is um, really needed. Uh, the third thing that we bring to you on the stormwater utility this year is uh, we already told you we've been notified that we are a CRS-5, which means that our people in the community that, get, um, uh, that need flood insurance can get a 25% discount, and we are the first city and the only city in the state of Georgia to be a CSR-5. That's under the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, we've completed our development tool for when we do uh, make the turn and development starts again for um, water quality and uh, water quantity issues. Along with that, and we'll go over this at your goal seminar, we, have not, we are in the final aspects of finishing a stormwater quality credit for the stormwater utility. In the education aspect this year, um, <coughs> We, again, uh, are working with the Spalding County Extension agent, and as she begins to grow, this is, she'll start her third year this coming year. Things are really starting to pick up. We're having more workshops, more training, more hands-on contact uh, with these participants, both city and county and all the schools at the fifth grade level. She get, this year, we've handed out over 1,000 water conservation kits. Uh, we had a very successful, again, uh, ENS day. This year we added water quality. We went from a one day to a two day event. And we had morning and afternoon split sessions. So you, you ended up having to talk to the same people, uh, different people, but m once in the morning, once in the afternoon. We had to move it to the auditorium. The school system worked with us on that because we ended up with 201 participants in 94 different agencies. Uh, we also sent out this year in your mailers, um, you've got information on the flood management program. And we also sent out just recently our pet waste management um, program. As you know, we adopted an ordinance on that earlier this year. Um, we distributed over 850 um, EcoMaster um, DVD games this year throughout the community. And we, we were able to, uh, give, uh, to present and give out over 400 uh, um, uh, DVDs on Only When It Rains. On our operation maintenance side, um, basically we've about 5,000 catch stations were cleaned this year. About 12,000 linear feet of storm line was cleaned, and we planted 75 trees uh, in the community. Uh, on the environmental side, we continue to move forward with our different types of sampling, and this year we went to two dry samples, two wet weather samples. And in conclusion, 
We met our stormwater permit requirements and exceeded them this year, which is a good thing. If not, we can be in consent. Um, we put ourselves in good position for the next presentation on the 2012 state water plan, what you plan to expect. And as I've told you earlier this, uh, this month, um, again, 10 years later, we were awarded the best stormwater program for MS4 in the state of Georgia by the Georgia Association of Water Professionals. Would like to say thank you for, uh, to you all for um, going through um, and supporting us in the budget to make all these things happen because without the commissioner, the stormwater utility would only be half as you know, effective. And by you all letting us move forward, you'll find that you're going to reap the benefits in a few minutes of what we've done over the last 10 uh, years uh, in the program. So that's the update on the stormwater utility um, for the 2010. Does anybody have any questions or comments, please? Brent, I do. Yes, ma'am. Um, back on the 13th when we had that of October when we had that tremendous rain, we were picking up friends on Brook Circle to go out to eat. And I have never seen such flooding and such runoff that was going down from either Fifth Street and College Street down on Brook Circle. It was it was really where it dips there was kind of dangerous. Um, some um, of the challenges that we have in the city of Griffin that you'll see over the next two years is we've now delineated all the watersheds and you'll start seeing capital projects. One of them right now is in the process behind uh, Spranger Manley building over there. A lot of our lines are no longer working. They're clogged. They've been in the ground so long we can't get a jet back through it. And in the old days, the, 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 what I call the rule of thumb method is, is down the road a piece, we'll put a catch basin. The rule is now 600 to 700 feet maximum to put a catch basin in. And a lot of your storm or water structures, uh, back in the early parts of the, this century, you didn't worry about what was downhill. You just planned for what was right there on the location. So when you get downhill and you plan to address the stormwater issue, all they did was match the existing pipe that was in the ground, not taking in consideration the volume of water that was upstream. So we are planning and we'll be presenting to you uh, over this, this coming year a capital improvements plan to start making some of those corrections for the issues that you're bringing right. up. Right, and I, well, you know, I, I mentioned that because you mentioned the uh, pipe at the library because everything drains down that way. You do, you, I know you know there's a natural stream there between yes, the Kramer House and the, uh, oh heavens, the house next to it. Yeah, and it actually goes underground at one part yeah. and hits the catch basin and then moves down. Right. I know he had a lot of problems with uh, spring water this year. A spring hit. Groundwater the, came yeah, up again it, this year. Yeah, it just really, really drove him nuts. Well, I just wanted, I said I would mention that because it really was unreal. Of course, it was one of those, you know, real big rain. We don't get that often. And um, we'll note that on the projects. All right, this is the next thing, if you can bring it up, please, is I talked to Kenny about this, and, you know, I said, you know, I think it's time to let you all understand what we're going to be challenging or faced with over the next couple of years with state water plan. Now, obviously, um, Commissioner Marr and myself have been involved in this pretty heavily for the last three years, but I think it was time to try to give you a brief orientation to what's coming down the line. A lot of times you don't see in the budget process some of the things that we have to go through in order to get to a finished product. And I think this is uh, this will help you understand a little bit about what's going to happen in 2012. Uh, three years ago, the, the, the state legislature said we're going to have a state water plan that it need to be implemented in 2012. So we're going to go and there's a water conservation implementation plan that went into place uh, a year ago. And then how does this interface with stormwater permitting? And I know this is probably dry for some of y'all, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible and try to give you a brief overview. So we sit in the upper reaches of the Flint River right there and that's, and we are in this area right here. Um, and it's called the Upper Flint. And this is the area that we're responsible um, to, for water quality and water quantity issues. Um, we get, from time to time, we get regular correspondence. This is a piece of correspondence telling us basically what to expect out of the water plan. And in the water plan, there's four tiers. And in those four tiers, basically, they, they require uh, water conservation practices. And a lot of communities, older communities, aren't used to seeing.
seeing these. Um, they're starting to see them more and more. The first here says they're going to be required already and in, in by either through statute or amended rules. Tier two, and you, just following along, it basically says you're going to go through certain metrics. Tier three, we're going to get we're going to go into these in a minute, and then tier four. Tier four has to do the state water plan and a thing called the gap and what's not downstream and how we're going to get water more water downstream as we start looking at the process through an analytic and I guess regression analysis of the entire basin. Tier one. So a lot of this stuff we're doing because we're very fortunate that we've been put, we positioned ourselves in the community and in the state to be one of the more environmentally friendly folks and that we do have a uh, very good water system uh, and wastewater collection system from an operation standpoint. Always can be better though. Um, we want to, we have, what they're going to require us to do, and it's more paperwork and more time, and they haven't said an engineer's got to do it, so it looks like I'm going to get the chance to do it, so that'll save us some money. We got to submit an annual report. Um, we're going to have to do a loss detection program, uh, multi-tenant buildings. This is some of the reason I wanted to educate you all today. Um, when we start building back again, it, there's going to be a lot of requirements for water conservation and some of those metrics are and, and the state's going to take care of that because in 2012 you won't be able to buy a toilet anymore that has 1.5 gallons or more flush. So basically your toilets are going to go to 1.2 uh, 8 gallons per flush. Urinals, which a lot of y'all don't use but in public buildings are going to have to be a, a flush um, of less than a half a gallon or at a half a gallon. Your laboratory sinks will be one and a half gallons. Your kitchen sink will be at 2.0 gallons. And, and basically what that's doing is we're starting to feel the water conservation mode. As you're all aware, or if you're not aware, you know that we have an ongoing battle between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida over water right now. And the deadline for, the, for that particular um, issue is 2012 also. So that's kind of strange. Next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, water conservation and outreach. We're going to touch base on that a little bit. We're already starting to do that and I'll show you some of the benefits of that. Um, another thing that citizens don't understand um, sometime because if you ever go to the drought restriction page on our home page that links to EPD, you better be reading it because there's about this long of you know requirements. Yes you can, no you can't. Well, one of the things that here is that they're going to strongly enforce uh, in 2012 is the outside watering of landscape, nothing between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., and they expect us to enforce it and cite people that are not following the procedures. And they'll be handing down a set of procedures sometime in June for us to follow, and then I'll give you an update, or what I'll do is give it to you in a package. Um, we start talking about car wash facilities, what, um, they're going to have to be certified. That means um, all these small car washes, what we call mom and pop, um, are going to have to be inspected. If they don't meet the criteria for a car wash, they will no longer be in business. We don't know what that criteria is yet, but all new car washes will be self-recycling and um, there won't be any more open up a garage, um, wash a car, put it in a drain. The new state requirement says car washes will recycle. So a lot of folks that do detailing, this is why we're here this morning, try to educate you in a place that's not appropriately certified, they're going to have to close down. So I just want to bring it to your, your attention. And this is 2012, but I get, and we don't have the metrics yet, but what I'm trying to do is, you know, you all have probably a car wash in each one of your districts. Uh, you've noticed for the last eight years we've required these mobile washes to catch their water, suck it up, put it in a tank, and tote it off. So these are some of the requirements that you're going to see in the future, and you'll probably have some calls uh, on that issue once we, those regulations and guidelines are issued. Uh, in Tier 2, we're already doing a lot of this because we knew it was coming. Y'all, uh, I won't say voluntarily, when we were in drought, they kind of told us. We've got conservation rates. We send uh, thanks to Cogsdale. We have an informational system on the bill now, so you can see your usage from a historical standpoint. Um, 
meter calibration, we've really started doing that real heavy this year. We're going to get into that a little bit um, about what it is and how much it costs to do meter calibration, but the payback is tenfold. Um, that's on large meters. Um, basically, um, how we're going to be looking at the enforcement of outdoor water, uh, water reuse. Uh, if we're, we're probably going to commission a study uh, to look at what the availability is for water reuse in the city of Griffin and gray water. Golf course is a new metric in tier three, and then we own a golf course, and we're going to have to do a survey and an audit of the golf course. We're going to have to develop best management practices for that golf course to when to use water, when not to use water. We're going to have to look at new types of techniques for grass, uh, and a lot of other things that will actually hold the water on site versus letting it run off so we don't use as much surface water in order to maintain the golf course. The urban area, we're going to end up having to do a customer analysis. We're doing a lot of that now. By the time 2012 comes in place, we'll have completed most of this and we won't have to worry about that. It'll go in the annual report. And we're going to have to, more than likely, it looks like, adopt a waste use ordinance on water, meaning if you're wasting water, you're going to be, be subject to be brought into court and fined for wasting water, i.e., people that water streets versus uh, yards, things of that nature. Moving along in Tier 4, leak detection. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, you all have this in your package, so I'm not going to belabor this point and it just continues on, but basically you're going to all, and we require most of this now, we'll just have to update our ordinance a little bit. When you put in an irrigation system in your yard, you're going to have to have a rain sensor and a monitor and all those fancy things, and the green industry is loving that because they're gearing up to sell that, those, that equipment. City of Griffin, again, has been identified uh, both our reservoirs <coughs> out of 10 in the state of Georgia for potential expansion. Heads Creek by raising the dam. Um, uh, Still Branch uh, was another identified source, but I think the most, the most relevant target that the state might be looking at in the future is raising the dam at Heads Creek Reservoir and in increasing the capacity by 1.5 billion gallons of water. And there are some of the metrics in the, in the response, um, leak detection and data loggers. <coughs> I changed this slide, you may want to pencil this in or I will send you this slide because originally I just did all the mains larger than 12 inches but because I wanted to show you the magnitude of what we do with our staff and that is that we have 693 miles of water mains in the city of Griffin, yours says 180 or 159, that was 12 inches or bigger but what the point I guess I wanted to drive home is, is how much that we really have to maintain over the, the longevity of the system and the agreement that we have with Spalding County. Between Spalding County and us, we have 1,200 miles of water mains in the ground. And so you can do the math on that. This is pretty We've got 31.9 miles of transmission lines and hopefully they'll never blow so we won't have to worry about that. If they do, we'll be repairing roads and half the people we flood out in Pike County. But that's uh, what, what, we're, what we're saying here is, is we're going into leak detection. And in this year's budget, we will be uh, presenting you, it's a small start, and I'll show you in a minute what that cost is. But you can see some of the leaks. This is a six inch leak, and that's a 10 inch leak at the bottom right here. Uh, it gets pretty costly to get into that. The system's aged. Uh, this a hundred times. Been in the water business since 1890. Been in the sewer business since the 1930s. Sewer pipes last about 50 years, water pipe uh, usually somewhere between 80 and 100 years depending on what type of pipe uh, when it went in the ground. Uh, basically, we've been able through permit to be able to demonstrate to the state that we are replacing water lines in the community development block grant, which is a real <coughs> bonus to the city. Not only are we in helping the residents, we're helping our permit. You got the Community Development Block Grant 1, uh, 2008, 2009, and 2010, and that's allowing us to stay in compliance with our permit in replacing water lines. And I'm going to show you a metric on that in a minute. Automatic meter reading, uh, we've started. Um, we're um, we'll be, it's going to take a lot longer for the water department to implement it than the electric department due to financial uh, constraints. Um, 
This is a slide basically, this is uh, Flint River, it's TMDLs, it just has to do with the loadings that we're putting into the river system and we're going to have to show or demonstrate through construction projects uh, how we're going to stop putting pollutants uh, from the city of Griffin into the receiving waters. Um, you can see Cabin Creek is on, is on the list. That's floatables right there. They're listed for three activities. And down here, Potato Creek is listed for sediment and uh, fecal. And we won't belabor that point. We've delineated all the watersheds we're through. We're actually going to start a new stormwater management plan for the next 20 years next year. Um, and then we'll have a capital improvements plan to go with it. It's been 10 years and we'll have guidelines to where we're going to go in the future so that when we turn our permit into the state, they know that we know what direction we're heading. Um, education's a key. We've got uh, classroom education. We have stream walk. We use Wyoming Ties Park for outdoor education. Um, we have um, our ENS day. Uh, we sp speak multiple times and then we have a speakers bureau. I've had the opportunity to speak to five different agencies or associations this year on water conservation. But one of the, one of the details, and we don't know how it's all going to be worked out, but it looks like, like that you know, we're going to look at having a watershed education coordinator. But right now, um, without those metrics, I think we're not going to have to fund a position we have between shared staff making presentations. We should be in pretty good shape. Um, these are some of the guidelines that we just went over in, a, in, in that format over a 10-year period of time that you can look at and talk to me later. AMR. Talk about automatic meter reading, basically just ballparking it. In order to reach AMR complete with the water system, it's going to be year 2016. And it's roughly going to cost a million dollars a year to get all these meters changed out, replaced with data loggers and, every, and all of the above. Um, leak detection, the first year this coming year, it's going to have an initial impact on the budget of 127000 roughly. And once all the equipment's purchased, then it's a cyclic thing. But then after that, it'll run about $90,000 a year. If you're not familiar with leak detection, you're going to see somebody with a headset, fancy computers, and a van. He's going to look like a spaceman out there putting these little devices on water, on fire hydrants, and he's going to track down the leaks between hydrants, and then we've got to go in and repair them. Um, water main replacement, this is just a little bit of information, 80 years on the average pipe. You can see how much pipe we have. Industry standards basically say we've got about 40% pre-1930 in the ground. That's about 20, 277 miles of pipe that should have been replaced by now. Average cost is $100 a foot. Industry says you should replace 1.5% of your pipe every year, and you've heard this before in my presentations. Bottom line is, is basically you're looking at $2.1 million a year that we should be doing to replace water lines. And if you read enough journals and the, and the GMA magazine, when you hear of what they call the infrastructure gap, this is what they're talking about. This is a gap between your budget and what needs to be repaired. Um, basically, this is the last slide. These some of the mandates that we have that you can see on a reoccurring basis. Um, our education and outreach costs is about $50,000 a year. TMDL mitigation is about a quarter million dollars a year. Incentive programs we haven't developed yet, and that'll be about $25,000 a year for an average cost of about $280,000 a year in the budget that will be reflected. And I didn't want to take up more than 15 minutes, and I... I think I got How there. many cities in Georgia now are, have stormwater utilities? Um, right now there's 42 cities that have stormwater utilities and there's uh, I think there's 13 more looking to implement utilities. And Fallen County still does not have a stormwater utility? They have a stormwater program but not a utility, no ma'am. So they're, they're not getting any money in Fallen County to replace or to handle stormwater? Uh, no ma'am. And, and now that we're talking about water, I remind you one thing that, that also on the water permit they have their own uh, drinking water permit also. All right. How is this going to be enforced fairly if you have so few cities in Georgia doing a stormwater utility and, uh, and counties? The answer to that is is that you go through permit. Uh, Spalding County is an NPDS phase MS4 permitting agency. They have certain requirements and basically if you don't meet the requirements of the permit each year they 
kick it up a notch, I guess this is for no, <coughs> lack of better words, and if you don't meet the, the limits of your permit, then you go under consent. And right, then but, but cities that don't have it are not required to do anything about it? They will be. They, they will be. Charged a million dollars. And all we don't. We don't know what the plan. The plan looks like right now, uh, as far as what the how the permits are going to come out. And, and remind you one thing: state plans one thing. What what is there's two things that is very interesting in the process of my work uh, and Phil's. Every December, D and R board meets and writes rules. Those rules have consequences, and usually those rules fall back on us. I'll give you a good example. We're supposed to have a Category 1 dam inspection annually by EPD. We just recently received a letter from them stating that they are understaffed and undermanned and that they will only visit once every two years, but you will inspect your dam annually. What that means is that some consultant that does dams, and we have one, Mills Consulting, every other year we will pay to have our two dams inspected because they're understaffed. You're going to start seeing more of that pressure come down upon local government uh, and that rule writing is a pretty important issue because that's where it usually affects local government's pocketbook. The second thing that you need to be aware of is what happens 40 days a year. The legislature convenes. They throw 45,000 types of pieces of legislation up there. Last year and the year before was a very dangerous situation that had that legislation passed and it becomes statute, it would have cost us immediately around $15 million. And that's piping water back to the basin of origin, which Cabin Creek and about 25% of our water goes to the Okamoki River, but it's all originated out of the Flint River. Had that piece of legislation passed, Kenny and I would be sitting here scratching our heads trying to tell you that we're going to have to put in an elaborate pump station, expand Shoal Creek immediately to take that, and then do a point source discharge back to the Flint River. And uh, we will get into that during the budget cycle this year to... And we are completing right now for your presentation, should have it sometime December, probably come back to you in January, the final draft of the water management plan for the next 20 years and the wastewater management for the next 20 years. And in that plan, it'll have the two capital improvement plans um, for our facilities. I need to add a little bit to this, if you'll bear with me a minute. On this state water plan we've been working on for two years and I've spent goodness knows how many hours on. The gap in the upper Flint now is virtually zero. We have no gap. We have no excess water. We have no, or virtually no gap problem. However, the lower Flint has a 13% gap. They're not meeting their water uh, outflow 13% of the time. We are required by this water planning rule to go out to 2050. So at 2050, we're projecting no gap. So we're not having a gap in 40 years of growth. And the reason is all of these conservation and management practices are coming in, being phased in, because right now we're using virtually all the Flint River and the upper Flint that there is to use, and there's no more to use without creating this gap, they call it. So all this stuff will be in so 50 or 40 years down the road, there won't be a gap, and it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. We have that draft water plan online at Georgia Water Plan, and uh, it's in rough form. We're trying to finalize it to submit it by the end of the year. But the lower Flint is 13% in gap already, so the farmers down there are going to be facing a lot more increased rules and regs and permit problems. But they're expecting us in the upper Flint to get better, not stay even, to help out the lower Flint because it's got to go to over the dam at Seminole to to Florida. And I will say that our stormwater, that's the quantity part. The quality part's even tougher, but our stormwater is so far ahead of everybody else's in the state, they're going to be spending and paying out the yin yang to catch up with where we are. Uh, they got huge expenses because this water plan and quality is going to mandate they do all this stuff and uh, they haven't been doing it so we're ahead of the game and the education is a big part of it. One of the mandatory uh, parts of our plan is education to bring the and it's going to be a really serious uh, mandate which Brant's already been doing. So our stormwater plan, our utility is way ahead of most of the state 
But then we're going to face things like leak detection, and the state saying that systems, even ours, is down to what now? About what's the latest? Anywhere 15? from 15 to 18, depends on the they're, they're saying those numbers of leaks are, are unacceptable, and you're going to fix them because they want that water back in the Flint. Uh, Thomaston just sold a multi-million dollar bond package to replace water pipes. They're replacing huge chunks of their water pipes in downtown Thomaston, and they're out on the bond market with millions of dollars. We don't have the banding, the bonding capacity to probably do that, but this leak detection thing is going to be really expensive because EPD is going to say you can't have that many leaks. Well, what's going to happen is because you have so few participants right now, everything's going to get pushed back, which is unfortunate. Uh, it's a plan, which plain and simple, and we're complying, and that's the main thing that we're doing because we're taking care of ourselves. The problem is going to be in the implementation all over the state of Georgia. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's if it follows the usual pattern, they'll keep pushing it back, pushing it back. What did you say? They've already gone back on dams uh, every two years because of manpower. Uh, yeah, but they put the lost. responsibility on yeah, us. Yeah, they put it back on us. Exactly. I, I, uh, I tell you, I think that, the you know, gun we're under, though, is the federal judge in this water usage. So the state has itself in a corner. Well, that, <laughs> I, I agree with the state. I think that because we are ahead of the game that we're not under any gun right well, now. Well, y'all can't divorce yourself from the fact, too, unfortunately, that whether we like it or not, the Flint is part of the Chattahoochee at one point. So what happens on the Chattahoochee is going to get mirrored over on the Flint and vice versa. The one positive thing, note, so I'm shut up and sit down so y'all move on, is that since we went to Cogsdale, we've been able to get better data on what's going on. Uh, in our system and one of the good things is is that I can tell you that at, at one time per capita means per 2.6 people in the home okay the average person was using 88 gallons of water we've been able to take a look between conservation rates which really work which is bad for business loss of revenue and we're going to meet one of those goals today I did the the average for the last 10 months and inside the city of Griffin, we've gone from 88 gallons per capita to 66, and that's a pretty good metric. And if we hit around 58 in the future, we shouldn't have a struggle and put a lot of burden on the residents of the community to have to do severe retrofits and what have you. Now, we're going to present some incentive programs to move forward. But between conservation rates, the drought, and better reporting systems, and that's what this is all about every time you hear us talking about we want another computer module or whatever it allows us to better understand what we're doing and thanks for listening this morning Dr. thank you Doc. dr keller in regards to spalding county and their system um, at what point do we need to master meter the lines going out of the city of griffin so we better understand whether our water loss is mainly coming from the city side or coming from the county um, side we know those this year we did that when we did our uh, we have a master ma a metering schedule currently in hand that would tell us where those points are and what happens from that point. Right now, basically, we use the law of averages that we know what the population base is residentially because that's where your leaks are going to be, and we know we're both in the city and county, and it's divided up that way, and that information is provided to the county. They're 50 basically, they're 56 percent of the total sum of water loss in the system due to the, the number of customers they have and the miles of lines they have. But what? that's an estimate. That's not a, a sure thing. Well, it's as because probably good as you're going to get when you've got a fragmented system. In 1988, the foresight should have been a whole lot better than it is now, but that's what we got to deal with. But we do have in hand what it would take to master meter our system versus the county's. But right if now. you master meter, you know exactly how much water <coughs> is being yeah. consumed. So four million dollars. I can, I can master meter. <laughs> can, that's what it costs. It's, it's 3.9 million dollars. If I if I invest 3.9 million, I can master meter the entire city of Griffin and reroute a couple lines because you got to look at how it draws back and we but we have that plan we did that in January this year and we have that information the, the rub here and Brent hasn't really foot stomped this but we are literally this water plan going to be mandating less and less water use less and less water sales so our revenue sales are going to be going down and down at the same time the state keeps ramping up things we're going to have to do so this puts us in, in a declining revenue and increasing cost 
Well, right. the, best, the best thing that happened right now is that the IDA land a couple of customers in the industrial park over there so we could sell some water. Right, that would really be nice. The, of course, you know, when all of this starts, there needs to be a lot of, uh, of pulling in Georgia legislators for presentations so that they will be educated. They created this mess. Oh, I know they did. I know they did. <laughs> they almost created the last one last session. So it's... Uh, you know, but we'll need to do that. But any time that y'all want more data, like Ms. Todd, if you want to come in or anybody that's interested, just come by and I'll be glad to show you some other information. There will be on. exceptions for fish ponds and swimming pools. Uh, not exceptions, but there will be guidelines. On I'm not, at this <laughs> point in the game, yes. it's all it's all on the table for EPD and statute to, to Thank take you. care of. Not Thank you all. Not this Good job. <clears throat> okay. Okay, on our regular agenda tonight, we will have our engineering firm, Jacobs Engineering, come in and give us an update on the presentations of where they are on our comprehensive transportation plan and uh, you have some information in your packet and they'll be here to review this information and answer any questions you may have as to the status of that plan. Anybody have any questions on that? Uh, item number two I, is... I do have a I'm question sorry. actually. One of the difficulties I have looked at that is so many of the, the projects are projects that say LCI study 16, LCI study 14. It's really hard to know what all those are. I mean, those are specific projects, but... We require to put them just now is Northbrook, Elsie, Westbrook, and Elsie, and Frederick and I both can give you good points on what the project is. And it's going to be a Well, when I sat on that meeting the other day and you want some, they were asking the consultant for, for priorities, I'm going, well, it's hard to give priorities when you, all you get is LCI jobs. You don't really know what, specifically what's in all those, so I found my information lacking, that's all. Awesome. Okay, item number two is our um, public hearing in regard to our 2009-2010 CDBG conflicts of interest. Well, Frederick's coming up here. I'm not going to most likely be back tonight. I've got a court appearance in Old Benny, Georgia this afternoon right after lunch, so I've got to go down for that. Frederick's going to handle this hearing tonight. Um, DCA came back to us a couple of months ago. We had, at the time... Uh, you initially submitted your applications for the 2009 and 2010 uh, CDBG grants, which was part of the three-phase process, 2008 having now been completed. Uh, in 2009, Cynthia and uh, Doug had properties in the target area. In 2010, uh, Will Evans and, and Doug had properties in the target area. And they came back to us and said that HUD had audited them and that they wanted more public input as to uh, the effect of having commissioners who had owned pro uh, properties that were affected by the project in these areas. So they wanted us to re-advertise. That's why we're holding a hearing. We advertise this uh, once a week for two weeks over the last two-week period. Uh, we're going to ask tonight, Frederick Scott, we got a summary we prepared. If you look right under your public hearings, tab and, and Cynthia let me ask are you going to be here tonight mm -hmm. you, you're not that's what I thought Frederick will summarize the the second page of what we call the uh, the public hearing sheet which is a breakdown by commissioner uh, Commissioner Ward's residence at 419 Palace Street Commissioner Evans residence at 427 North 8th Street and then Commissioner Holberg has properties uh, owned either individually or through Holberg Properties, Griffin Parkside developers, or through his brother or his father. 
they're all within You've this area. You've got 514 Lane Street listed twice in that first section. Okay. Well, do and leave it out. If we put it in twice, that's okay. But okay. Well, we didn't leave it but out. It's, um, but if anybody from the public should show up, we frankly doubt they're going to. But if they should, they're entitled to come and to comment on whatever effect they think this has on the the project. Now, it looks to me like this is a little too much, too late. Uh, frankly, because we're well into the 2009 CDBG and we've already held the kickoff meeting and started to acquire. Uh, do design work to acquire properties for 2010, but this is being requested by DCA, so that's why we're doing it. Well, I've observed all three of our commissioners who are part of this, and they've all been very strict about recusing themselves and keeping above it, so. I agree, and it, this it, is it's all been noted in the minutes as well. That the minutes are clear that there's been no participation by any of the three who have properties in the affected area. Any questions about that? Somewhat overkill, but that's what DCA is asking for, and rather than put us in jeopardy with them and future grant possibilities, we felt like we better overkill. Well, it's Ethically, it's probably the correct thing to do. Uh, I, I mean, I, I haven't really followed that, but uh, poor Doug's going to have a hard time all over the city if we had to see any future friends. But all these Doug. properties were addressed to Frederick through each. I mean, we've, we've given a list for each zone. I think there's been yes, appropriate the disclosure throughout the process. I, I think yeah. the real key to it is they didn't feel like there was enough public notice of the fact of disclosure. Right. That's what they're looking for is more, more notice. Now, I think now we've given them that. Okay. okay, while Mr. Gardner is up, he has uh, several other public hearings in regard to special use and rezoning, so I'll let him cover those. Thank Please. you, sir. No, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have a rezoning request uh, at 319 West Tinsley Street, uh, project number 10 rez 3 The applicant, uh, Renana uh, Youssef, is seeking to rezone a property located at 319 West Tinsley, consistent of 0.25 plus or minus acres from medium density residential to neighborhood business district. Uh, the request is to develop the site for a new daycare center uh, that will provide uh, service for a working class minority community within walking distance of their homes. Uh, staff in the Planning and Zoning Board had reviewed the application at their meeting and had recommended down zoning the request uh, below the neighborhood business district to institutional and that would assist with hopefully not allowing for the adjacent property, which is the convenience store, having the opportunity to come in and, and rezone, even though it's a non-conforming use at this time. Uh, staff had recommended denial of the request. The Planning and Zoning Board recommended approval of the request from MDR to institution. Uh, and with that, staff would recommend three conditions. And the two, three conditions are that one, all buildings shall be constructed of brickstone stucco party board or any combination thereof, vinyl siding is prohibited. All new buildings shall be residential and designed to be approved by planning and zoning staff. And number three, there shall be no pole sign placed on the property. Applicants shall install a monument sign not more than six feet in height and 32 square feet in the area. And I, have, I have a number of thoughts and questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, I think couple three of us sat in the P and Z meeting and heard this. Uh, I think it's a worthy project, but the convoluted reasoning to get us from NDB to institutional bothered me. Uh, I think it ought to be NDB if that's what it is next door. But the applicant stated they wants to bring some trailers, some of those rental office trailers like they use at schools for overflow there to do this so they could do it inexpensively for this. And I know the city would freak out over that, plus these conditions prohibit that. So what he really wants to do, he can't do probably with these conditions. 
and I can't imagine sitting trailers there to make it happen. That wouldn't be proper. So um, I don't know. So I'm I'm kind of curious what Cynthia thinks up there. This is. I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly where it is. Find a little convenience store there on Ninth Street. <coughs> So, is that Ninth Street or? Oh, oh, that's what they have. Nice yes, it's on the street. That's the that's shooting. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. Tinsley Street, isn't it? That's yeah. not Ninth Street. West Tinsley. West Tinsley. North Ninth. It's right yeah. behind okay. the triple, uh -huh. right behind the Triple A grocery store. Uh -huh. The vacant parcel behind the Triple A grocery store uh, on the corner. The reality is, it's zoned residential, but no, nobody's going to build a house behind that uh, convenience store like that. It needs to be NDB added to that, in my opinion, but. This this convolutes a lot of things here. So, and for further, yes, ma'am. I don't want to bring in trailers in there. Well, right, that, but, we wouldn't agree to that, but I don't have a problem otherwise. I, mean, but, I think that a daycare may be sufficient in that area where people can walk to it. And, and that's what Doug was noted by staff. And one of the issues that, that they have with the planning zoning board, and we had with the discussion of going to the neighborhood business district, the soup, the super eight. The tri uh, AAA grocery store is a non-conforming use. It's still residential. <laughs> uh, the issue that they had was that, and the same issue we had on South, uh, on North Sixth Street, was the issue of con rezoning them to a commercial zoning. And under the interpretation of the city attorney, neighborhood business district is a commercial use, just like PCD, and would allow for sales of alcohol. Yeah. So with that, I think the reasoning was, if it's allowed, if if we can find another zoning district that would allow for it outside of the neighborhood business district and with that the institutional zoning was one that we see was better suited to allow for the daycare <coughs> use um, and then that would avoid any any potential of the adjacent property coming in for rezoning to a neighborhood business district with the opportunity to sell alcohol in the neighborhood yeah I'm gonna say it again this this convoluted system of in certain areas you can't have commercial zoning where in other areas you can have because of the alcohol issue is just creating a huge discrepancy and unfairness in our if you're going to have a commercial zoning and have a convenience store it ought to be the same no matter what color the neighborhood is or what direction or what well, geography or anything else this is ridiculous does he have a permit to sell alcohol down there uh, not that I know of. Under the, under the zoning, he wouldn't be allowed to be. He had to have a commercial zoning. Because we stuck him in residential zoning, which is bizarre. Well, he built in residential zoning. Well, it was we already. Really it's, I think it's been, it was built a very long time ago. Okay. Yeah, a long time, a long time. And that, and that citywide rezoning messed up all kinds of properties that weren't what they were, and I got stuck with several of those. Had to come back and rezone to what it was used for. And planning and zoning board member, Mr. Castile, actually, his business is right Mm -hmm. in proximity yeah. here and he, he actually mentioned that as part of the, his justification for this is that his property was caught up in the citywide rezoning back in the 90s that yeah. rezoned him to residential even though he has a manufacturing type yeah. use on if, his property. If they don't build on the institutional, would the institutional automatically go back to the No, it would not. No, no so it would not. Change back. So there's no way to do a and, and conditional less, rezoning based on whether they build or not build? We no. could do that uh, in terms of how legal it would be. That's something we probably want to ask Mr. Whelan. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. rezone. Usually when you rezone a piece of property, you, you rezone that property, it goes with the property and not the owner. Uh, I'm familiar with that area. And uh, my problem is the congestion and the traffic. I think it's unrealistic to believe that all those people in that area are going to be walking their kids to a daycare center. Uh, most of them will be in automobiles, and I think that's uh, I think the congestion and the and the safety I think that's going to be my biggest issue. Well, I think that Drew will agree with me. Under state law, you can't deny zoning based on traffic. That is correct. It's illegal to deny zoning based we're, on traffic. The not, presumption is the government furnishes the streets and transportation and. Can you deny it based on upon safety of the? Of the you can can it be denied based upon safety? You can yes. look at safety as a factor, but we would actually have to look at if the safety issue is is walking. Uh, we currently have sidewalks in and around that area, so there's pedestrian traffic, especially on Ninth Street, which is more heavily traveled um, because it's north it's north south corridor leading into the county than West Tinsley at this point. I think. 
on this part of the West Tinsley Corridor is where West Tinsley slows down and comes to a curve right as you come behind um, the H Street Baptist Church on Pilots. That part, the roadway basically reduces itself. And so the potential for traffic conflict would be on 9th Street versus more so on 10th Street. Well, I know. What is there, what alternatives would they have? If it's denied, it will stay it's medium density denied. residential. Now. And it's useless. Okay, even if, um, if it's medium density and uh, the store is zoned neighborhood business. The, the store is zoned medium density. As and well. medium density. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and he, they're proposing to build a daycare on in the very back where the car wash used to. Nobody don't know about the car wash. Where well, used to be a car wash. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what other use? There's no other use that um, a special use that they could get to do that. No, ma'am. We have eliminated special uses in the MDR the zoning district for any type of commercial or multifamily. The issue I have with um, the, the, what I'm, we're finding is that these people come before us and ask for these rezoning, and then they don't do it, they don't build anything on these lots, on a, a bunch of them. We got a bunch of people coming to ask for rezoning, they rezone, even down on the, by the hospital, somebody came and asked for rezoning, other places, they asked for rezoning and then somebody asked us to rezone up behind belts for some kind of business, they don't do anything. They just get to rezone it. Can't we give well, a time well, limit to build, build on it, otherwise it reverts back to what it was? We and can that, do and that, was a discussion, that was a discussion we had earlier. The yeah. problem, problem with that is we typically do that with special uses. Um, you know, when you rezone a property, you rezone a property because your future land use map, which is your guiding principle as it relates to land use planning, either says this property shall be zoned to a certain classification and that becomes a legal process to automatically revert it just because they don't build on it is problematic and that's something that I think we'd need to fish out more so with the with the city attorney but in my years of experience the only way you revert property and, and that's been problematic because we tried it in Henry County some years back and, and got legal challenge and it didn't work even though, other, we, even though other, we had a reversion thing, clause the in the thing is, in, in that same district, just a, a block over, there is a brand new daycare that has just op that's just opening. So, where where are the children gonna come from? Well, for the daycare. One of the things we recognize in this area, and I, and I know uh, Ms. Ward that that you and and Commissioner Bill Evans could could attest to this that, and as part of our studies that we've done uh, redevelopment plans, this area has the most children in the city of Griffin all located on the north side of the city. That's okay. predominantly where most of your kids between the ages of zero, one and 15 are located in the city. Mm -hmm. So there is, from our standpoint, and when we evaluated, we didn't know about the new daycare being opening. Um, we saw that there is a gap in terms of the service and for daycare, daycare service in that area. And so that's why we wrote the staff report in a way that kind of explains, this is where most of our children are located. Um, there is a potential need. However, our future line use map did address this area being zoned commercial. <clears throat> so if, if with the Planning and Zoning Board's recommendation, they're saying that we understand that there's a use here, there's a need here, therefore we recommend approval of it. It's up to the board to say, okay, this is now our new policy in this area to move the zoning to a commercial use to address the issue of, of the daycare. And no, I, daycare. I, well, I won't approve anything but institutions. No, when I say commercial use, I mean yeah. the use for a daycare center and, right. and well, institutional use provides for it. Uh, just like Commissioner Sherry just got to speaking about the safety. I noticed uh, back in the past, the store there on the corner, Triple Eight, have have been robbed. You have had shooting there. What have you? So we're looking at the safety uh, aspect of it. Uh, we well, spoke about it, but I, I can understand also Commissioner Morrow just saying with the state and all that you cannot deny. It's something really to take a look at what, what we're looking at here. Uh, the surrounding, have you looked at Triple Eight? Yes, sir. We 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 actually we actually that was one of the things we looked at. But if if you look at these, especially in these areas where we do have issues of, of higher crime, if we use that as the basis, we probably won't zone anything for any okay. use. Uh, and so <laughs> with that, we recognize that yeah. yes, there's an inherent risk. I think we, 
risky. Walking into a bank is an inherent risk because somebody could potentially rob it. So, but we don't want to use that as a basis to yeah. deny potential service to the community. Uh, I noticed even when the when the car wash was there, it was a, a huge safety issue as far as traffic is concerned, coming in and out of that car wash. That's where I'm, that's that's where my concern lies. Yes, sir. Frederick, is the applicant uh, have knowledge of and agree with condition number one? No, sir. Not that I know of. No. It was no, he don't have knowledge of it. Uh, well, it was brought up at the zoning meeting. It was brought up at the zoning meeting, but I don't think he, he didn't. He didn't state whether he was against it or or. He or, didn't. Or, yeah. Uh, it's not my district. Your district. Pro against it. We did it's talk about the issue of of the trailer being placed on site, but that would have to come and meet certain specific <laughs> criteria. Boats and wheels. Trailers that he's potentially in wheels, which is the eight pitch roof, roof size. Which I understand. I just, what's the, in regard to what Mr. Morris said, I just wasn't sure if he yeah, and, and I, and I think, that. And our goal is, and I think that we, we kind of brought that over, that our goal is not to have, even though if you meet their criteria, you can locate them in the city, but our goal is not to allow for them to end up in the city as a primary as a primary use um, for a, a potential daycare or any other use. But he, but he needs to know because his business model may not work if it he's got work. to build a, a brick, stone, or stucco building. Here, here's or, or how to right, you know, which, I'm not worried about whether they build on it or not. Let's put the restrictions on it and zone it institutional. We're protecting the area. And then if he can't build on it, then in the next amount of months, it'll revert back to what it was. No, uh, it won't revert. You can't revert zoning. Zoning is zoning is zoning when you change it. He just said you, it would revert no, back. No, no. Cannot. Well, the, the zoning is going to stay with the zoning the is going to stay. We have to have a really. Well, then maybe the church will eventually will expand over there in institutional, and that will take care of it. Here's what we have: we we are discriminating against property owners on the north side of town. This is rank discrimination, like the Touchstones and others that have proper being used as commercial purposes can't get commercial zoning. They can't expand. And it's all because of this alcohol thing. So I can't be part of discriminating against people on that side of town to use their property. It's it's wrong. The touchstones have got property that's sitting there vacant because they can't get commercial but zoning. We we've we've taken that. care of their property. We've owned that, and, they, and, and it's still sitting there vacant. That, that yeah. issue has been addressed, Commissioner Moore. They have done, not done anything. And that, that's the issue I have with these people hounding us about changing the zoning. And then they still leave the stuff sitting there just like that, like it is. And, and to speak to that, Ms. Ward, you know, you know when, when folks actually look at opening a business or developing a business, the part that we're not privy to is, is the issue of how they're financing or their business plans and if that model doesn't work before they can get the project off the ground. But we still have to look at if, if, if that owner brings a request before the Board of Commissioners to look at it, to weigh the, weigh the criteria and decide whether or not we're going to rezone the property. Uh, whether or not it's developed today or developed tomorrow, at some point somebody is going to take advantage of that zoning and build on the property. Um, what, in the MDR? If, if it's MDR or if it's, or if it's I, institutional. I would go with neighborhood uh, business district. I would not vote for that. And, and somehow we're going to have to find a way to neighborhood business district or put some type of gap between a residential house and an old commercial building. It's not fair to the residential person to have to have an alcohol establishment right by it, in my opinion, in terms of this here, um, or whether it's the old Simmons grocery store, or whether it's 6th Street, it's, it's or whether... A, um, it's 8th Street Church. What, what's the it's church? It's right there on the corner it's, across it's, from it's, me. There's uh, houses MDR. butt up to the Mr. Is O'Mean's MDR. place it's both sides. Is, uh, the church is what, MBR? The church is MBR. But you changed the rules that we had set up to protect those areas by eliminating the corridor system. The corridor system solved the problem, kept it on the state roads, and out of the neighborhoods. And that's basically, and of course, now I, didn't, I voted against that because I felt it was discriminatory. It was discriminatory. Against the mom and pop grocery store. It's a convoluted, but, another convoluted system. We need yeah. to get past this. It, it's not uh, discriminating against these uh, businesses or what have you. Uh, they want a daycare center, I can understand. I think what I'm looking at is more or less speaking to the people in my district, see how they feel about this. If they say it's a plus, let's go with it. And don't think it's going to work. Hey, the citizen got a right 
the don't come in behind us. I, I'm curious as to what Mr. Youssef would think about the the uh, condition set because at that meeting I didn't get the distinct yeah, impression that he understood uh, those conditions. Uh, basically, I, I mean, my, on a top level view, I just worry about putting something cheap there. You know, when he came in and he was explaining what it was it wanted to do, it was very up in the air, uh, you know, very very non-committal to anything just I'd like to put a daycare there because uh, okay, okay. I want to give back to the community or something like that but then as soon as he said you know putting the the trailers as as the community I'm sitting there thinking that's aesthetically that's uh, cheap it doesn't look good I don't think it enhanced that that property or neighborhood very well so the fact that we've got a condition here that's talking about constructed brick stuck in all that I don't think he got he understood that or or heard that um one so I'm not of the sure other things that, that. that i found and which probably ain't none of my business but sometimes a lot of people like you said they come in they don't really know they don't really have a plan somebody suggested them if you have this property zone commercial or neighborhood business and sell it you can get more money for it and i understand that's the nature of the business of, of trying to get what you can but if he get it rezoned and sell it you know, or not sell it. It's just the fact that you got a piece of property and you think because it's not zoned neighborhood business, you're going to be able to get more money for it. We had several people to come in to do that. And like I said, I don't have a problem with that, people making money. <coughs> but the thing is, even if he builds, he's already talking about coming in and bringing trailers. Well, he we can't allow that. Up. We wouldn't allow that. No, no. The city doesn't no. allow that, does it? Not with this well, condition. No. So not, with the, not, with the, not with condition number one, but if the condition right. number one was in there, he would be able to put a, a trailer well, on, we, the, we on site. Wanna, I, wouldn't wanna, I would not approve it without the conditions, period. And, and I think to, to delay your affairs, Commissioner Ward what, and, and Commissioner Todd, what we could do is condition it that he can only use it as a daycare, and if he doesn't want to convert that use to something else, then he'd have to come back before the board to to get an approval to move beyond the, the um, daycare. That would be so a you can but, but he could build an institution. He could build a a small church if you wanted to. An well, if if you are a condition number four that says that, that the use is restricted to a daycare center only, uh, and any other use shall be approved by the by the by the board of commissioners. At that point, if he decides that he doesn't want to build a daycare, but want to put something else on that property. He would have to come back can we, can, board can we do that? I, I, we, can't, you can, we can do that. We can restrict the uses down, but we, but in terms of reverting the, the zoning, that's problematic. But in institutional, it can't do much anyway. It is restricted. They There's a limit. The, the institutional place thing down here on North Hill Street, they got big trucks coming in down there, backing in and stuff. It's institutional. Yes. The old Northside School. Yes. It's on institutional. They they got all kind of stuff going on there. Yeah, we turn our eyes I, on that. I don't know that that's still zoned institutional, is it? Yes, it, it is. It never got rezoned? Yes, no, no it did not. the rezoning did not pass back, and I think before I got here, it went before the board. And I think nobody enforced before, institutional before zoning? Well, it was institutional because it was a school. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> so we well, how did you put a manufacturing plant in an institutional zone? <laughs> is it a manufacturer? Yeah, yeah. and it Somebody was asleep in the switch. It was not manufacturer, as I recall. And the institution, he said he was going to be uh, um, some kind of school supplies or something they yeah. won't be distributing, but uh, anyway, well, whatever. If you put the restriction on, you got my vote. And, and anyway. to, to let everybody know, the permitted uses under, under institutions are publicly, publicly, publicly owned buildings, facilities, and land, local government, federal government offices, quasi government, uh, local authorities, sub state and non profit agencies, private schools, daycare centers, or nurseries. Public facilities are aligned for non-commercial park recreation, um, building facilities and land for the distribution of utility uses, services, cultural facilities to include libraries, museums, uh, cemeteries. Um, those are the permitted uses under the institution. So it's limited. It's very limited. In the scope. What if he wants to put an office there and rent it to uh, McIntosh Trails or something? 
You have to come back before the board commission. Uh, if, if you put, if yeah. you limit the use, you would have to come back before the board in order right. to. Right. Okay. I think that's crazy. Okay. All right. Please. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> item item number four on your agenda is a uh, special use request for 350 North Expressway. Uh, Divine Worship Center of the God and His Word Church is seeking approval of special <coughs> use to allow for the utilization of an existing structure for places of worship. Uh, the property zone plan commercial district and a special use permit is required to designate the subject property as a places of assembly overlay. Uh, the purpose of the PAO places of assembly overlay district is to encourage the beneficial development of assembly uses to properly regulate such uses in a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, the planning and zoning staff had recommended denial of this request based on the fact that the church requested church and the property doesn't meet the specific outline in the PA ordinance as it relates to acreage and road frontage. Um, Planning and Zoning Board recommended approval of the request with two conditions. One, inspection to be conducted by a fire department for life safety and occupancy requirements. And two, the special use would be voided if the applicant vacates or abandons the use. All right. And for further clarification, <laughs> The Planning and Zoning Board wanted us, the staff, and I guess the board to look at this because we've been having numerous requests for churches locating in, in small convenience centers. And what we've seen to date as it relates to this is that, one, some of them don't open, either from financial reasons after they've gotten the, their places of assembly overlay and, they, and it's voided because we put conditions on them. Or two, they open but they don't stay very long, they outgrow the spot and then they're looking for a new location. So it loses the uh, zoning then, don't we, it? Yes, because we put that condition to avoid them as soon as they leave. Um, but because these are coming in on a, on, on a very frequent basis uh, and, and the board has actually approved them, uh, it's something that the Planning and Zoning Board want us to look at somehow amending our zoning ordinance <coughs> to create these, to allow for these to go in, recognizing that for the most part they're temporary uses when they're located in these, in these areas. Uh, they're not growing in those spots, um, taking up more and more more commercial structure uh, area. They're either outgrowing them or they're not opening at all, or they open, they recognize they can't survive, and they close. We have not been enforcing the place over, place of assembly over lays in the required size. We haven't enforced that at all. We keep giving in to all these little churches, so. That's correct. Then we need to just change the rules, because this is ridiculous, bring every one of these up that wants to rent a storefront. So I think if you're going to build a church, own a church, we can enforce the, was it two acres or one acre, whatever it is. If you're going to own a church, okay, it, they own the building. But if it's a rental use, why don't we just make it pretty much approved and let these places rip and go on down the road? We're spending a lot of time on these every month, and they come in. We always... You, you on the staff always disapprove them because you're following the rules. P and Z almost always approves them because they understand what's going on. We vote to approve them and let them go down the road. I give up. Why don't we just let them go if they're renting? Have the church. I, well, I think what you need to look at when you're looking at the places of assembly, remember it's not just churches, it's any places of assembly, but I think the number of persons, uh, the number of occupants is probably where you need to draw the line because a lot of these churches you're talking about 15, 20, 30 people, uh, and I think the intent of the places of assembly overlay is where you have a larger number of persons, and I think that's the reason for the two-acre requirement, the road frontage and all that, because places of assembly, you're thinking about 100 people or 75 people. You're not thinking about 15 or 20 people. And parking requirements. And parking requirements and all that. So I think the intent was for, was for a larger number of people 
when you think about more of a freestanding type church or assembly place. Well, why don't we set a number then? If you're under 30 people, you get a pass. We, we need to pick something that we don't have to have these every month. I, I agree. And, and I will why, why, why was it all of a sudden that they start doing this? What happened? Did uh, we require it? Is this something that we require? Did they, they go through this the process? To go out and buy land uh, and, I did, uh, for, apply for a pet place of assembly over well, there. Well, they want to open up a church, especially this specific one wanted to open up a church, uh, and she's been looking at for areas around. She'd actually look at the old Walmart shopping center, um, and that was cost prohibitive, so she ended up still on the North Expressway corridor, but at a cheaper rate, was able to get a lease on the spot, and so she's now wanting to open up the church at this location. Uh -huh. Those I'm places saying. that we have approved, uh, have they been a nuisance? Or is they, would you say, have improved the area somewhat? Uh, or I have was, we even cared? I would say neutral. We, we, they, I, I can say we haven't they had any They used to just come and just open calls. up a church. They just open then up Then all of a sudden, everybody start coming asking for places of assembly overlay. I'm asking, is that something that we, we require that they do? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, yes that's well, part of our um, ordinance. At the meeting that night, she said that she's having th sometimes 35 to 40 people to meet in her garage and, and in her living room. And, 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 the neighbor, and the residential area, and if I lived in that area, that would really bug the Jesus out of me because I don't want all that traffic. And, 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 and I'll say this, Commissioners, and I think the city attorney will speak to this. The reason why I think we adopted this ordinance is back in 2000, and 2000 uh, Congress passed a law called RELUPA, the Freedom of Religious Land Use Act. Mm -hmm. And what that did was because people were actually meeting in their residential homes and conducting churches and impacting neighborhoods, um, a city in filed an injunction against one of those uses. They filed suit and actually won in, in Supreme Court. And from that, new law yeah. started how we govern these things to treat them all the same rather than discriminating against them because they're located in residential. We came up with a provision that allowed for all types of assembly outside of certain residential areas, if they meet certain criteria, they're allowed to go in. If they're not, they can't just locate in somebody's house, house work ser services there. And we understand that as much as we uh, are, are people of religion, we understand that religious institutions do have impacts on residential neighborhoods. And as Kenny well, was talking to, they do outgrow and do do and take up a lot of space and do add a lot of traffic to yeah. neighborhoods, and so you have to be very well, this, careful. This trend government. for storefront churches is relatively new. You didn't used to see this much, but I, I think we need to set some number of criteria below which you sort of automatic approval, and also, naturally, it can't be any more people than the fire marshal let in your building. So that limits the building by the fire marshal. But, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, whatever it is, and, and get them out of here because we're going to prove it anyway. Uh -huh. Drew going to tell you we can't do it anyway. <laughs> well, we'll tell Drew what we think we can do. So. Well, you probably just need to go to your places of assembly and more clearly define what an assembly so is. And, and so we'll, we'll look at that, and I think Kenny... Kenny's recommendation of, of occupancy is something I think we could use as a trigger that governs whether or not they come before you or whether or not they're administratively approved. But right approved. now, that, that, that will be in the future. Right yes. now we're faced with this. We're still faced with this in uh, process. You know, you, it, we, get, we have to vote on it. It's not a big deal. I don't know why. It, you know, it'd be easier. It's like the, we used to have to vote on alcohol ordinance, uh, licenses for businesses to come in and turn that over to the city manager. And, and it, it would be easy to turn this over to your planning and zoning board to to uh, make that determination so it doesn't come to us. But then again, part of our job in representing residential citizens and everybody else is to discuss these issues and be aware of what's going on in our community. Uh, and frankly, uh, while it may be a, a, a pain, whoever owns that property is going to get some rent out of it, and uh, that will make them happy. And I've never seen one of these yet that created a disturbance. I agree. We haven't had any complaints at the So, you date. know, if we don't like it, that's our problem. Mm -hmm. We've got to go ahead and do what we have to do. Well, I'll say this, to put this one to bed, this is in my district, and uh, I see no problem with this little church there. Yes, sir. We, we love Mother. Right. She, she was very charismatic when she came before us <laughs> and, had, and very ambitious, so, you know, She'll outgrow it. We may it. have the next mega church in our community by this, with this lady. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
Uh, item number five uh, is, is one of the same, the uh, 1248 North Hill Street uh, is requesting the True Way Ministries is seeking approval of a special use request to allow for places of assembly overlay to utilize a suite and existing within an existing structure located at 1248 North Hill Street as a church or places of worship, the property zone medium density residential, and the commercial use along this corridor is considered legal non-conforming. Special use is required to designate the subject property as a place of assembly overlay district. That's once again, staff would recommend an aisle of this. The planning and zoning board recommend an approval of it with the two conditions. One, uh, fire inspection, life safety, and occupancy requirements from the fire department. And that if the use is not utilized or is abandoned, the special use permit is voided. And this was brought to our attention through code enforcement with the utilization of the property um, one day on a Wednesday and on a Sunday. Yeah, the operating use operating quite some time. We had brought code enforcement. Do you have any problem with this one? I will say that if this one is approved. Right there in the flats. I think we need seven churches there from some of the bays. That's what I'm saying. And, and <laughs> <laughs> we don't need you Bible. They don't have a better with it. No problem with it. And commissioners, I will, I will say that uh, I agree. Right, right next door to this is another church that was also cited for code enforcement, so they'll be coming through with an application <laughs> pretty soon as well. I think we need to put one across the street in that Well, wait, store. how much does it cost them to get a, to get a permit? Uh, 250 to 300 depending okay, on Okay, so we're going to get 200 to $300. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well. All right. This we are not going to turn our nose up at and for planning a, and zoning for 250 of This is a revenue enhancements thing, huh? <laughs> Proven churches? Go. If it wasn't for churches, we wouldn't have the revenue coming. And it'll pay your salary for a couple hours, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I see you smile. <laughs> you got a job. <laughs> Listen, we can't sell water anymore, but we can sell churches. There you go. <laughs> uh, that's concluded. Hey, she got to sell anything. That's okay. <laughs> okay, item number six are our minutes, both of the regular meeting and the workshop. If there are any corrections, we can have those corrected by tonight. Will he take those individually tonight? That same. Uh, I just found one little misspelling. Other than that, we got Offer Hudson in the uh, in the minutes. We changed him to Officer Hudson. He probably liked it, that better, Offer Hudson. Hey, you know, I just bought uh, Vince Lynn's new book, and I've uh, almost completed through with it in two days. But you know what? They're, they misspelled thought, and I paid money for that book. Misspelled what? Thought. T h o u g h t. They left the T off of it. Oh. And uh, that's probably. Oh. Three hundred and eighty-one, oh. <laughs> and so it irritated me no end because I paid money for that book and I wanted to not have any errors in it whatsoever. Well, I suggest we change that <laughs> that to Detective Hudson and Sergeant Mike, or uh, Detect, I mean Sergeant Hudson and Detective Mike Morris. How's that? We can make that correct. Other than that, I found them okay. Can't we just do it on our page? Yeah, you don't need to print new ones if you don't want no, to. That's we'll, not yeah, we'll just reprint, reprint the official document and make those corrections if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll skip down to item number 10, which is to update our ordinance in regard to water conservation and drought management is required by Senate Bill 370, as if you've not heard enough about that already. But uh, we can entertain any questions. No big brother mandated this, so. Any questions? Always. That's what my wife keeps telling me. I need to be compliant. That's not what she told me. Okay, <laughs> item number 11 is to award the bid and contract for the street resurfacing. Yay. And when is it going to be ready to go as soon as he can make it? And I'll give Hill credit. They they come in low bidder almost all the time. They're very aggressive pricing. <laughs> That's right. And we're asking for that not to exceed 850, even though the bid's a little below that. It's a per unit price, so it gives us a little fluctuation there. Okay, item number 12 is purchase and installation of 2K software, 16.995 for backflow. We couldn't afford 3K, so we settled for 2K, 2K. right? 2K. I 
I thought we were going to add, uh, but let's go back to the roads. I thought between Brian and I, we were going to get Maddox Road in there. Be the next time. Okay. But let's not forget <laughs> Maddox Road in phase two. The city hmm. manager is getting pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Not from me. It's a curving it's gutter while you're at it. Curving gutter while you're at it. Road over 3K. Hey, Doug, I'll be glad to see the sidewalk on Hill Street. Going up to the city. Yeah, I hope the pig is still there. Show his neighbors he can make it. Item number 13 is approval of next year's holiday schedule, even though one of next year's holidays is in this year. But that's just kind of the way it fell. Mr. Neville is here, and he would love to address you if you have any questions. All right. Why don't we add Veterans Day to this we holiday can't be a schedule? Uh, you know, I, that's uh, becoming a revered day, and one that uh, what? I was surprised that because I know you're a veteran. What what day? Oh, Veterans, Veterans Day. Veterans Day. Yeah. Day. Oh, well. the, uh, you know. We're used to getting shot at. What the heck? But I well, just wondered why we don't. I, it, it seems to diminish it when only the federal government is the one that takes the holiday. Staff would, I'm sure staff would be more than welcome to add holidays to the list. But, uh, from a budget curious. from a budget standpoint, you don't, oh, it's it's Friday, it might be difficult. Okay. Unless you want to no, 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 substitute. No, no, no. I just was curious. No, I, I like every holiday that you no. got for them. Did they get to select them? Ma'am? Did they get to select them or have input? Oh, no, ma'am. We just, it's the same holidays we've had every year forever and ever, so. Unless you want to substitute one for Veterans Day. Mm. No, I mean, I, only if they suggested it. I would think about adding it. I think these are good. Okay. I'm guessing they would double the holidays if they could. Uh, the uh, one that's interesting that had been challenged is Good Friday. Yeah, we're one of the few places that uh, still gets Good Friday. You can always substitute Good Friday for Veterans Day if you'd like. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> <laughs> he knows he'd be struck That's Brian down Daniel immediately. Easter egg, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay. That's a fishing. Uh, yeah, that, yeah no, I just, no, no, no. I just asked why we didn't. Yes, ma'am. You know. The, no, the answer is know. just because we haven't in the past, I but have, uh, there are a lot of places that do recognize that. I have a real too. aversion to lightning. I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling you, you're telling you already enough, huh? Okay, item number 14 is the annual request from UGA Griffin Campus for their 17.5 that's budgeted. That brings in more people than anything we do. That's the best money we spend on the Well, next fireworks. we're going to get a request from Griffin Technical College to pay one of theirs, too. Or Crescent, Southern Crescent, pardon me. And the last item is, of course, Ms. Todd mentioned uh, in her comments last meeting about her appointment to the board, and we just want to make that official. And uh, it's we'll not, a, official tonight. not an item to vote on. It's just her appointment, but we'd like to make that, put it on the agenda so the public can be notified. And while we were on UGA, I just got an A on the second test. <laughs> you going to make the D <laughs> <laughs> has, not, has nothing to do with the 17.5 we're giving them, I'm sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it does, if my if wife it does I'll accept it. it. Well, technically, y'all might have a problem. Yeah, I need to abstain because my wife... Y'all might need to abstain from that. I'm going to get a degree. <laughs> and hopefully a job in January. Oh, okay. You're not old-fashioned. It's been a tough few years. I, I know. Is that it? We done? Well, uh, that's the entire agenda. Yeah. Okay. We're still planning to have our goals, our mini goals workshop in two weeks. In two right? weeks, yes. May, may, may I ask something? Would this group be willing to discuss changing to a mayor system? Spend a few minutes on that. I don't have a problem with discussing anything y'all want to discuss. I, I'd like <laughs> to do that. Talk about the advantages of changing to a mayor system. Like other cities, so we have a few minutes for that. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. The staff has basically going to discuss what you guys want to discuss. I mean, we, we don't really have an agenda. We're going to. I give you my items. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to go back to our February right, workshop right, right. and update you on the things that you wanted us to look at back at the beginning of the year. Uh, so that's our only agenda is just to update you on those items and then get information from you. If you'd like to give me your items, I'll put that in the form of an agenda so the other commissioners can be thinking about and formulating discussion points. So we'll do that as a workshop. That's a good time to discuss. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That morning in yeah. two weeks. Okay. We done? I am. Nice to Make a motion to adjourn, Madam Chairman. Second. I'm sorry you had a public